Hi folks, Astronomy Live here. Tonight I'm going to be making a prediction about the start of the next SDO eclipse season, where the Earth will be passing in front of the Sun from the perspective of the Solar Dynamics Observatory, blocking it for a period of time each day for a period of several weeks. In my previous webcast, I tracked the SDO spacecraft live and showed you those images as they came in from the camera. The SDO spacecraft is the bright dot seen here in the middle, and stars can be seen streaking by in the images. And using these images and the data I've collected on the SDO spacecraft, I will be making a prediction about when the next SDO eclipse season will start and what that will look like. And I would like to make note of the fact that at the current time, on the official Solar Dynamics Observatory blog page, there is no announcement uh, predicting the start of that eclipse season. And as far as I can tell, NASA has not made any official announcement yet about when they predict that eclipse season will start. So this prediction will be made using just my data and has nothing to do with any NASA announcement that may come before the start of that eclipse season. So you might be asking yourself right now how these images are useful for making any kind of prediction. How do you go from having images of the stars streaking by and SDO is a tiny little dot in the image to having useful data for making a prediction? Well, you do that by astrometrically measuring its position over time. Measuring the position of SDO over time allows you to calculate the orbit. But the stars are not fixed in the image, they're streaking by. So what I've done here is I've overlaid a catalog of the stars on top of my image. The cataloged stars are the red circles, and I've deliberately positioned them at the at the start of each streak, which is when the exposure actually started, and we know exactly what time that occurred. That's saved in the header of the FITS files from the camera. And so now we know the position of SDO relative to these cataloged stars. SDO is this dot right here. And because we've overlaid the cataloged stars on top of where the streaks begin, we know where SDO was at that particular moment in time. Once the stellar catalog is aligned relative to the image, all I have to do is click on SDO to get its precise coordinates relative to where that stellar catalog had been aligned, in this case, the start of the exposure. So by doing that over multiple exposures, I'm able to get coordinates of SDO as it changes over time. And I did this spanning the length of the webcast to generate this table here in IOD format. These columns give the right ascension and declination coordinates, and this column right here gives the date and time. So I have multiple exposures here that have been measured spanning the length of the webcast and a few more exposures from itelescope.net back on January 30th. And by combining that data, I'm able to calculate the orbit of SDO. And I've done that here, and you can see the resulting orbital elements in TLE format. This has been propagated forward to February 14th, 2017, because as it turns out, that is when the next SDO eclipse season will begin. By propagating the orbital elements forward to that date, I can make a more precise determination of what the first eclipse of the coming eclipse season will look like, because the orbit does gradually change over time due to things like nodal precession, which is very important in determining the date of the SDO eclipse season, as well as what it will look like. But at the top of the file here, you also see two additional lines of orbital elements that correspond to about the time that the webcast was occurring. So you can have both the TLE of the orbital elements as it was being observed, and a TLE at the bottom of the file showing uh, the orbital elements propagated forward to February 14th. This file will be uploaded and linked to in the video description. So here is the situation predicted for February 13th, one day before the first eclipse of the new SDO eclipse season. And this shows the closest approach of the Earth to the Sun predicted by the orbital elements that I just showed you. Earth is rendered as a blue line, and the Sun is rendered as a green circle. And you can see that uh, we have some coordinates over here, as well as a size for the blue circle. This is given by a spreadsheet that I created at the end of the last SDO eclipse season, which correctly predicted the final eclipse of the previous SDO eclipse season. I've now updated this spreadsheet with the new orbital elements, 
so that all you have to do is enter the date and time and it will give you the coordinates of the, of the Earth relative to the Sun to enter into SAO Image DS9 to create a chart like this. It also gives you the radius of the Earth which you need to enter as the radius of the circle as well. So by doing this over multiple points in time you can actually visualize how Earth should be moving based on those orbital elements without having to uh, simply feed them into some planetarium program that you may or may not trust. So by entering the coordinates from that spreadsheet over multiple points in time for February 14th we can see this animation of how Earth should be covering up the Sun on that day. And keep in mind that the extent of the eclipse will vary from wavelength to wavelength because the Earth's atmosphere is extremely opaque to extreme UV wavelengths that SDO observes in, but the extent to which it is opaque depends on the wavelength. So as I showed in my previous presentation, uh, recapping my successful prediction of the last SDO eclipse season, I showed you this chart which shows how opaque the Earth's atmosphere is to a given altitude for a given wavelength. And these wavelengths correspond roughly to the sorts of wavelengths we see with SDO. Some of these longer wavelengths are less, uh, the atmosphere is less opaque to them, and so you can see deeper into Earth's atmosphere at those longer wavelengths. So the Earth won't eclipse as much of the Sun in those images. At the shorter wavelengths, you can expect that the Earth's atmosphere is going to be even more opaque to a higher altitude, uh, almost twice as much in some cases, and so it can look more eclipsed at those wavelengths even simultaneously. So that is what we expect to see. So take the blue line as sort of an approximation of what some of the wavelengths may look like, but others may look more or less eclipsed depending on how opaque the atmosphere is exactly. Um, this image here shows the predicted maximum extent of the eclipse, um, but again, this will vary a bit depending on exactly how the orbit is perturbed over the next few days, as well as how opaque the Earth's atmosphere is, which will vary depending on which wavelength you're looking at. Now, after the eclipse occurs, I will take the raw images and do my own processing of them so that they're not quite as over-contrast enhanced as the default JPEGs sometimes tend to be on the SDO website. But they do make the raw FITS files available for download, and you can download them and process them yourself. So even using the old orbital elements uh, that I calculated from the previous eclipse season, if you propagate them forward to the same date and time, you actually find that those observations are pretty good at predicting the start of the next SDO eclipse season. And you can see the result of that prediction here. This is using the old astrometry from the previous eclipse season when I was observing SDO with my telescope originally and calculating its orbit based on those observations from last year. So just based on that astrometry from last year, not including any new observations of the spacecraft, but propagating the orbital elements forward to account for things like nodal precession, it does predict the same thing, that uh, the Sun will experience an eclipse caused by the Earth on February 14th of this year. Using those propagated elements from the old observations of the spacecraft and calculating the position of the Earth relative to the Sun one day prior for February 13th, we do see that it predicts the Earth to miss the Sun on that date. This image again shows the closest approach predicted uh, between the Earth and Sun for that date using those old observations. So they match up quite nicely with the new observations even though they were conducted at completely separate times. So at this point some might be wondering why this year the February eclipse season starts on February 14th and last year it appeared to start on about February 19th. Some have complained that this can't possibly be due to SDO's orbit because these eclipse seasons do not occur exactly six months apart. And in fact, they appear to get a little earlier each year. And this has to do with the fact that SDO's orbit is not static. It changes over time. Uh, among other reasons, it changes due to nodal precession, which is caused by Earth's equatorial bulge torquing on the orbit and causing it 
its uh, longitude of ascending node to change over time and actually decrease in longitude over time. So here's an animation of sort of a generic orbit and you can see the longitude of ascending node is denoted by this red arrow. Now I talked about this in the uh, previous presentation I gave but I just want to reiterate a couple points here again because if I don't I'm sure it's going to come up. So as you can see over time the red circle of this uh, satellite orbit appears to move away from that red arrow very slowly. And so over time, if you fast forward it, you can see that the point where the satellite crosses the equator is no longer where the red arrow is pointing in space. And that is to be expected, and that's exactly what is predicted to happen uh, with SDO's orbit. Its longitude of ascending node is supposed to decrease over time. And so its orbital elements are not static. You have to propagate them forward in order to accurately predict when these eclipse seasons will actually start. And as far as the timing of the eclipses themselves, it has been suggested that they should be 12 hours apart in eclipse seasons that are roughly six months apart because the satellite is on the opposite side uh, of, the, of the sun. So here it would be on this side, and then six months later, if it's in the same position relative to Earth, it's on this side. Well, the problem is that we don't measure our days relative to the background stars. We measure our days relative to the sun. So our watches are set to solar time, not sidereal time. And by sidereal time, they actually are 12 hours apart when the eclipse occurs. So for example, I've actually calculated sidereal time from Estio's perspective here. And again, I went over all of this in greater detail in the previous presentation I gave at the end of the last SDO eclipse season, but I just want to reiterate this here briefly so that it's out there if the question comes up again. If you go back to, say, uh, 2016, August 21st, and let's see, an eclipse is happening here. Notice that by sidereal time, it actually is about 12 hours apart. Uh, from the eclipse that is predicted to start on uh, February 14th. So, yes, it depends on how you monitor time. If you monitor time relative to the stars, then the eclipses, when they occur, uh, they actually are 12 hours apart in eclipse seasons that are about six months apart. But by solar time, they're not. So there's a difference there between a 24-hour solar day and a sidereal day, which is a little less than 24 hours. So that's why that happens. Uh, those are all the major points I can think of to address before the start of this eclipse season. But if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. And if you like this video, please like and subscribe for more. And stay tuned for the start of the SDO eclipse season.